A simple phone call could have cleared up some of the problems encountered by believers in that early church of the Thessalonians. But we didn't have any phones. Let's pray. Father, we're doing a study on Thessalonians. It was a great hub at the time. Roman roads were built well. The trading routes, the ship routes were and cargo were flowing. One of the biggest ships in the Roman, or maybe harbors and hubs in the Roman Empire. And uh, you directed Paul over there. He couldn't go to Asia, couldn't preach down where he was. He had to, and he could have just walked around and started ministering down there. Wouldn't have to sail and, and walk and maybe take a donkey, I don't know, to hundreds of miles to go up to, to preach where he wanted him to. We ask you to give us wisdom and understanding, open our eyes to be able to see these things, see something. Everybody sees things different at times. I used to investigate accidents and talk to everybody there, and everybody seemed to have a different viewpoint. Well, they did have a different viewpoint. But show us, Holy Spirit, what you want us to see. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Turn to Second Thessalonians. We did one on First Thessalonians. Not enough. You could you could go into these and delve into these epistles for days and still not hit it hard what was going on at the time if you look in history it's pretty hard to find something around 50, 51 AD I mean, overall they didn't keep a bunch of stuff I, I looked everything I could look up you know you find out who's the Roman Emperor you find out what well, some of the wars that were going on and who changed hands here and what was being shipped around there but you didn't find out great details about, the, you know, your great, 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 great uncle Johnny was being born or whatever it was. He didn't know, there wasn't hardly anything for me to see. Anyway, we he could have started this with just a phone call, taking care of most of it. But the apostle then had to be, had to dictate his response to that letter that he received and have someone, someone had to find him, first of all. Uh, he had to track him down wherever he was and give him a letter with questions the apostle then had to to dictate his response and have someone hand deliver a letter in return that took some time because of the distances and slow modes of transportation this process took weeks even months at times now the intervening time span often allowed false beliefs to spread you have to snuff those out quick because the human being, the demonic powers and human beings working together and the powers of darkness seem to just crawl. You got to get with it. They're, they're speedy. And we just crawl along trying to cover it up or we think God's going to take care of this. It doesn't happen too often like that. You have to get in there and get with it. Stop all that false doctrine. The spread. There are 45,000 different types of Christian faiths. Each of them seem to stop at certain places along the road and set up a church. Uh, I've been to so many. The basic thing that I see in every one of them, if they're really Christians, is they love Jesus. They're born again. Well, they think a whole lot of stuff, but you can't throw them out with the bathwater. They're your brothers and sisters. They're thinking and believing something a little bit different than you, probably. But that's what they believe. Paul had to write this letter to correct the false ideas about the second coming that had arisen in the church. The second coming. The author of this, of course, was Paul, and date was around 51. Paul identifies himself as the author of 2 Thessalonians and even calls attention to his own handwriting at the end of the letter. He said, you know, I wrote this. This is my own signature, my own handwriting. You know who it is? It's me, Paul. In uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 17. Although many of his early church fathers, a lot of them, including, uh, I'll butcher these words, Arenas, Tertullian, Tertullian, and Clement of Alexandria, confirmed that this letter came from Paul. Now, some modern scholars, modern scholars, have questioned the letter's authenticity. And I get so surprised. You get filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't, you're going to need him. He's called the helper, the paraclete, the come alongside, the shore, the teacher, the teller. He's not going to do it for you. You have free will, but he will be there to help you. 
And sometimes it doesn't help. He doesn't help like when you want him to, but he does help. Some have asserted First and Second Thessalonians teach contradictory doctrines about the second coming, of course. And these are liberals that wouldn't, <laughs> if they ran over Jesus, they wouldn't know they hit him. The first letter is said to teach an imminent return of Christ. I'm going to stop right here, first of all. This whole shindigs about Jesus. It's not about you and doctrines, how smart you are and so forth. They didn't have the whole Word of God. They didn't have the Bible. They had the Old Testament and prophets. I mean, you got word through prophecy. Prayer means you pray in tongues for two and a half hours, three hours, and the prophets start speaking. The gifts of the Spirit start flowing. If you let them flow, that's how you had. Well, honey, that's all you got now. You take the Bible and say it's true from cover to cover. It's true. By God, I know it's true. And I've met them, and I said, are you baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues? No, I don't have to now. I have the Word of God. And I'm saying, okay, you're, it's probably dry. I'd say your life is kind of dried up because the Holy Spirit, He keeps it lubed up good. Believe me. Well, don't believe me. I don't care. If you don't have the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues and stay there, look, I pray in tongues because I'm dumb. I have enough knowledge to know that I, I don't have any knowledge. I'm smart enough just to know that I'm not smart. I'm not. I'm not worldly smart. I'm not smart at all. I have dyslexia so bad I can't read sometimes. It just gets scrambled along the way and I have to turn tapes on. Now, I can understand it if I can hear it. And maybe I'll have to hear it 10,000 times to hear once. I don't know, but I won't stop. You need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit. But the second coming had included an intervening period of lawlessness before the Lord's return. That's what it said. A closer examination of the question revealed that the instructions of the two letters concerning the end times are complementary to each other, not, not contradictory. First Thessalonians emphasizes the suddenness of the Lord's coming to those who are are unprepared, while Second Thessalonians highlight some of the events well, that will occur before Jesus returned. I, I always thought that was wonderful, but I didn't base anything really on his return. I know that I'm going to see him in my lifetime because I'm going to die. Everybody dies. Everybody's going to see Jesus one way or another. You're going to see him. What did you do with him when you were alive? Nothing. Does everybody think you're stupid? The Holy Spirit opened my eyes 40 years ago. And I could see that the Lord was Jesus. I didn't really much care before then. The Holy Spirit had to show me. I've I'm I'm come to realize that if the Holy Spirit doesn't show you the kingdom of God, it's like if you wouldn't know dirt from gold unless the Holy Spirit opened your mind up to see, to see it, to receive it. Satan would have you down as an animal and keep you there. Just an old animal. Animal ways. Animal th and thinking, oh, you could think, yeah, you come out of slime, you fell out of a tree. No, you did not. No, you did not. Now, since Paul wrote Second Thessalonians to correct a, a misunderstanding that had risen from his first letter, the difference between the two letters are understandable. Second Thessalonians was written from the Corinth shortly after First Thessalonians, uh, around A.D. 51 or 52, around there. Now, some of the backgrounds this, Paul had encountered stiff opposition when he went there, on his first preaching in the, the gospel in Thessalonica, in Acts 17 and 19. Now, I know most of us kind of crater in. You know, you go to a synagogue or to a church, and they take you up. They're either going to love you or take you out back and whip you or beat you to death. Can you imagine that going to your church now? And they just decide, well, we're going to hear you preach, and then we're going to we'll, we'll go grade you. We'll grade you according to the size of rocks we can get at you. They were forcing him to flee at night to Berea. They did. Read it, Acts 17, 1 through 9. His travel soon brought him to Corinth. From that city, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica because he got worried to ascertain the condition of the church and everybody that was there, and which which I've done many times. You just lead a bunch of people to Christ to have a, a revival. Something's happening, and those that are, that are appointed come in. Now, a lot of times people don't believe that. It's kind of a hit and miss thing for you hear the gospel. Might take, might not. You're appointed. Everybody hears it. Some respond, some don't. Don't spend 55 
years trying to get one in when you could have got you know, 5,000 into the kingdom or more. That one's going to take up your time. The devil sends somebody to you. They take up all your time. Righteousness needs to go elsewhere, not just pour it into an open pit that's not going to do anything with it. Now, Timothy returned with an encouraging report to Paul. The Thessalonica Christians were they were enduring. They were just enduring despite persecution. Now, I don't know if you've all been under that persecution. Most of the persecution probably, probably from the Jews and some of the proselytes, but mostly the Jews. The world didn't much care about them. You didn't hear them being stolen, killed and stoned by the world. The Romans killed them because they wouldn't bow their knee to Caesar. Not only that, but the testimony of the Thessalonians, they were steadfast in faith. They were spreading throughout all of Macedonia. Macedonia was a state, let's say. It was just the state. It was a country, but it was a state. Thessalonica was part of it, down to the shoreline, because it was a hub. Inward roads and outward harbor, and both, vice versa. Same thing in Genesis, in the, in the garden. Look at that, where God told Adam, look, there's rivers going out of here, and I want you to take this thing all over the earth. Take your pretty people, have your pretty children, and we're going to make this whole world a garden. Well, they were doing it. That's the only thing that was available for them to do that. And it wasn't just Satan doing it. God did it for people. He loves the Lord. The Lord loves people. He just does. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I told him two or three times, well, more than that, you don't want these people in the in the kingdom of God that I was working for or around. And I'd hear him nudge me inside, get them. And I go, they're nasty. I don't want, no, I don't like them. Even as I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't like them. Then he would get them. He would save them, pour out his spirit on them. They would see Jesus, and I would go, that just amazes me that he does that. What does he see that I don't see? Probably everything, but he sees it all from beginning to end. But I don't, I, no, I wouldn't have done it. That's how smart I am. Paul wrote a letter to encourage the young church and to answer a few questions that they had sent with Timothy. Now, he wrote Second Thessalonians soon after that to correct some misunderstandings about the end times and to encourage false teachers that had crept, not to encourage them, to encounter them, basically, go after them, that crept into the church. Here we go. <laughs> it's what they do. They just filter in there and change your doctrine, you know? I watch this George Soros fella. He has dementia now, and he's a billionaire. He didn't attack America, and you see he attacked America. I'm an American, so I can say this if I want to. He didn't attack, attack America to have the laws changed. or He got people put in. He got governors and prosecutors in the government, state and federal, paid for the college. Paid. He did set this up long term. But they weren't going to change the laws. They just weren't going to enforce them. Isn't that amazing? Now, since the writing of 1 Thessalonians, reports had come to Paul of continued progress. They indicated their faithfulness to the gospel. However, doctrinal problems had set in and arose, which does. False teachers had begun to tell the believers in Thessalonica that the day of the Lord, well, that's already come to pass. It's already at hand. These teachers were misapplying and possibly even twisted Paul's teaching that the day of the Lord would come suddenly, 1 Thessalonians 5.2. Now, most likely because of this, some of the believers had stopped working and were simply waiting. They weren't, they weren't doing anything. They were sitting around. And Paul had to stop that. There were some it, it said, in, the, in the world coming around. They would just kill themselves. We we're going to go on early. He said, stop doing that. Go to work. You don't work, you don't eat. Now, most likely because of this, some of the believers have stopped working and were simply waiting for the Lord mounting. Persecution may have also fueled into this. A lot of persecution will slow you down. These extreme beliefs about the second coming. Well, that separates the the men from the boys and the, the women from the girls, the persecution. If you know the truth and it's been presented to you, and then all of a sudden this darkness comes around, they just want to whip your beach of death. Most of all, they want to shut you up. We just go somewhere else. 
if you know the truth, they're going to do bad things to you all your life. They're going to write bad books about you, sing bad songs about you, lie at you, tell, them, tell, tell everybody you're stealing their money. He's probably going to steal your wife and your dog, too. Watch out. Paul started emphasizing that he had never taught that the day of the Lord had already come. He never taught it. He said, that I didn't teach you that. To the second false doctrine, Paul gave the Thessalonians a good dose of the truth again, explained to them that the emergence of the man of lawlessness and the prevalence of sin during the end times was strong, will be strong. Furthermore, he reminded them that, that he had been called by God and say they, they were called by God. They were saved through Jesus Christ's work. That's Again, he had, everywhere he went, he had to, you have to remind people all the time, you ain't going to work for this. Well, my good deeds are outweigh my bad. Now, if you were a Jew, you had a law you had to follow, and you do this. And they wrote all new laws, all kinds of laws. Those are the ones you followed. It was another little book that everybody read. Now, in view of this, there's all kinds of other little books that people read and kind of throw the Bible to the side. If I was people, which I've done myself, absorb the word. Well, it did just absorb it. Read it, read it, read it like letters. I didn't read it in verse and chapter. There's many times, there's a lot of times I can't tell you verse and chapter because I read it like it's a letter over and over and over. I want to get the spirit of that letter. Not the, I don't want this the law. I want the spirit. The law kills. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free. No, I need, you ain't going to get saved. You, you won't be free unless you get it in you. And you're gonna, you're not getting into heaven in my hind pocket. You just crawl into it and go into. We'll go to heaven behind him. Come on, Mike. I was having a Bible study one time. It was a lot of false doctrine, and, and uh, there was maybe thirty people there, and these big four angels would come and go, and the gifts of the Spirit flowed. I mean, it was fantastic, and I'm not embellishing. This this was just a great thing. I, I had revival in my life for twenty five years. I needed the Lord. I wanted the Lord. I told him all the time, I can't do this without you. I'm not going to do this without you. Unless your anointing is there and so forth so on. I needed you, Lord. Well, I had cast demons out of a boy because his mom said, that's not my boy. And the Lord had arranged it, and it was very interesting. Just that is, that story in itself is a good story. But he was, I made this boy, I got the demons out of him, we cast him out, and uh, it's not me, the Lord came. It was great. And I had him sitting on the couch over there, and he was just, there's a bunch of kids around him and grown-ups around the place. And all of a sudden, partway through, he started to minister and talk about, I, I can't even remember what we were ministering on, something. Well, it was good, but it was out of the Bible. This boy stood up and started talking to them demons' voices. He, when, he, when I cast the devils out of him, and he came back to normal, semi-normal, he didn't talk the same. His voice is different. He didn't know words like this spirit did. This thing knew two lang three languages. And uh, he spoke impeccable English. Uh, and she would, mama, the mama was telling her, that's not my boy. Why? My boy's not that smart. He's just not. I've known him. He's 15 years old. I've known him all his life. And this thing came into him in the hospital. Uh, he made some kind of deal in there. Which happens in hospitals. <laughs> you talk to God and talk to the devil. Of course the devil's going to show up. Well, he made a deal with him. And this thing had been out of him for maybe two weeks. And I had the word going, pumping the word into him as fast as I could get it in. Any way I can get it in. Headphones, reading. He couldn't read very long fall asleep. So I had to read to him. He was demonized. Well, he was sitting on the couch and all these kids were talking and praying and listening and so forth. Then the Bible study started and we started talking. And he stood up and said, I'm back, Mike. And this fear <laughs> would crawl up your spine, up your legs. I mean, the whole room filled with fear because this thing started talking. And he was back. Well, I thought you cast him out this day. Not. And I said, you cast him out. I'll try to come back. It says that the word. Read the word. I've never seen 25 to 30 people run behind somebody so fast. They uh, Behind me was a room full of people. And they were all screaming, get him out, get him out, get him out, get him out. And I wondered, why didn't somebody jump on him like a chicken on a bug, start casting the devil out of him or tell him to shut up? How come they were so 
I don't know. Some of them have been in the Lord for a while. And I thought to myself, I'm not teaching anybody anything. Am I shining in the glory of God? Is it Mike they're following? Mike follows Jesus, and, and we follow Mike and stay behind him. Well, I went over and commanded the thing to shut up, put my hand on his head, and put him down on the couch. And I had a Sony Walkman with, I think, Mark on it. And I pulled it out of my little briefcase and put it on his ears and turned it on. It was amazing what it did. Just settled right down. He'd argue with the thing for a little while, then he stopped. It took a while for him to get cleaned out, but a bunch of false doctors that went with it and just kept him bound up. These teachers were misapplying and possibly even twisting Paul's words and teachings of the believers that had stopped working. His mother went to a church that she attended and said, you have taught me a bunch of false doctrines and got me on medication and so forth. She had problems too. Mike Baker laid hands on me and Jesus came into my life in a stronger, most powerful way. And the word says this, this, this. And she started quoting the word, the truth. It's just the word. They had blend psychology with it, medicine with it, blend everything with the word. Well, the word is good, I guess. Okay. Well, the word says this. Yeah, maybe but we're doing this. But you can't have science and the word together and science win. That's how Christian science came about years ago. It's Christian sense. Mounting persecution, I may have fueled this up too as well, that the extreme beliefs about the second coming that was there. In Second Thessalonians, Paul stated emphatically that he had never taught that on the day of the Lord had already come. To encounter false doctrine, Paul gave the Thessalonians a good dose of the truth, of course, explaining to them the emergence of the lawless one, the prevalence of sin, of course, as we talked about that furthermore. He reminded them that they had all called on God and been saved by Jesus Christ. He reminded them, in view of this fact, he exhorted them to stand firm in Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. And to work, out, work hard. Just go to work. Work hard. Chapter 3, verse 12. Also patiently wait, waiting for Jesus' return. See, I look at it this way. I always have about this, and I've read this 40 years ago. I read the whole Bible when I first got saved, just over and over and over again. I don't think Jesus is going to leave me when he comes. If there's a rapture, he's going to take me. If there's a uh, doings, I'm going to do. If there's a comings, I'm going to come. If it's my, if it's my, if, he's, if I'm a Christian, I'm with him. And I've always heard this so many times. How are you? Are, have you kept good accounts with the Lord? Are you and Jesus okay? Are you right with the Lord? That's another one, too. I love that one. He's coming pretty soon. Are you right with him? You don't get right with the Lord one time. You belong to him. Why don't you talk to him? Talk his word back to him. He, he said this in your word. I want to thank you for supplying all of my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I want to talk to those people out there concerning doctrine. How dare you say God supplies all your need and takes care of you and does all this, but you don't do anything for the kingdom of God. You're not even hardly in it. It's a wonder he doesn't say to half, half the people that go to heaven, I never knew you. What do you mean? I prayed all the time, but you didn't shut up and listen to me. and You didn't read my word much. I didn't know you. You didn't go where I told you to go. I didn't do what I told you to do. I didn't know we had to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I bought you and paid for you with my blood. And I didn't catch you and pull you out of the mire and put you up on a good hill and throw you loose and said, have fun. And half of you went back to sin worse than you did before. And I was supposed to bless you and wash you every week. Go to church once a week. There you go. And go raise hell all week long. Now, that's not what it, that's supposed to be. So Paul gave him good doctrine about that. The second letter... Now, that's an attempt to weed out the erroneous teachings about that. Now, I'll, you know, we can read some of this. You'll find that there, it's, 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 he's not real clear, distinctly clear, about how you can think and what you can believe. Now, so many doctrines, so many beliefs. And then you get in a church and the Spirit of God's moving, and this man says all these things to you, and you don't know which to believe. That's why there are 45,000 different groups. Now, in the first letter, like in the first letter, Paul represents Jesus as the 
joyful hope of all Christians is eternal. That's that, that's how I always looked at it. I don't look for a return to this and this and that and this and that. Oh, it's good. I'm good. I'm, I'll be doing the more, doing what I'm supposed to do when I'm gone, if that's what he's going to do. I don't see that, though. That's breaking with his continuity all through history of what, what he does. All of a sudden, he's going to do the secret thing, take all his secret people. Well, there's Philip. He translated him. Well, yeah, he did that. I don't think he could get where he needed to go fast enough, so he took him. <laughs> this man called me. He was a vice president of IBM, one of them. There's a few, I guess. And it led his family to Christ, and he said, you know, it was a, about a year into it. And he said, could you come out and talk to my wife? And I said, you know, yeah, what, a, what What? do you need? She's out by this woman pool. Well, that's good. With her suitcases. She's got her dress clothes on. She's in a chair by the pool. Oh, is she? I, I, yeah, she is. And uh, she needs to talk to you. I came out there and went over to her, and I said, Oh, honey, what are you doing? I'm waiting. What? Where are you going? Waiting on the cab? Waiting on what are you doing? He wouldn't tell me. He wanted me to know by by her. I'm waiting for a translation. You want the Lord to translate you? Yep. If he can do it with Philip, he can do it with me. I want to go see my sister, and I don't have the money to get a ticket right now. We're paying other things off. So I'm just going to wait here. And I asked him to translate me in and got ready. My faith was to pack my bags and get my best clothes on and sit over here in the chair and wait. I said, oh, okay. Now there's a good possibility that you're not going to see your sister. That he's not going to translate you. You'd be better off believing him for some money <laughs> and maybe for a ticket to go see your sister. She had believed this. She had read about it a few times. Other people were translated too, and she read this. And this just got into her that she could go where she wanted to if she just waits on the Lord there. It's false teaching. It's wrong. And I straightened her out and just told her, she's not coming. I said, uh, you, you need to go put your clothes back up and kind of get ready for the day. you got three kids. Two of them are pretty much grown, but the other one's not. you got a husband. You help him whatever he needs, and do your day in the Lord. I guess she, and I went on about my business and told him, and I told her, she's, you know, she's hard-headed, she'll do what she wants to do. I she waited out there about a half a day. She kept the bags packed and put in the bedroom for another day, and uh, was very disappointed for quite a while. But she figured it out. False teaching had come. Paul attempted to, to weed out this stuff, teaching the church and, and all the good things. As in his first letter, Paul represents Jesus as the joyful hope of all Christians, as said. He eventually returned. He will return. That's what I kept telling her. He'll come, but he's not going to. That's not how it works. And he'll make up for that prosecution and suffering and injustice that we all go through. We're currently anticipating or enduring than they did. Although the Lord represents in his presentation will be it'll be worth it all when he shows up. All that hope. His return has awesome and terrifying implications at the same time, because I've told him many times over the years. And trust in salvation if you do it. First chapter one, six through ten, chapter two, eight through twelve will give you an outline of it. But a, a lot of people around me would say, oh, the Lord Jesus needs to come back now with so many wars around, so many things. He needs to come. Come, Lord Jesus. And I would go, no, you don't understand the implications of his coming. Apparently you haven't read it all or listened to the Holy Spirit or you know, get that in your heart and understand him. That when he comes here, this shooting match is over with. And there's a lot of people you may love and really enjoy. They're not going. You need to pray them in. What? Nothing happens on this earth unless someone prays. You beseech the Lord and just beseech the Lord. I've seen the heavenlies. I've seen big angels. I've seen smaller angels. I've seen angels. I've seen angels by the thousands. My eyes were opened up, and I saw them, and I was going, my God, we're inundated with them. How can this evil prevail, prevail on this earth? There's there's so many angels. And I was going, the Lord stays his hand because of free will. Boy, boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's going to be worth it. Believe me, you. 
But it was terrifying implications. Come, Lord, come, Lord, come. No, don't, don't do that. Go do the work of what you're finished to do. And people need to come into the kingdom. And there are people who didn't come in because you didn't go talk to them. You shoot your mouth off about everything else, but you don't go talk to them. You're afraid they won't like you anymore. Well, they don't like you now. Probably. They're just being nice to you. Tell them about Jesus. What? What? I became a mechanical contractor to get into people's homes, tear up their stuff. They're not going to get rid of me anyway. And I'd tell them about Jesus. The ones I was supposed to go to, we got toned down pretty good. Where The Lord would have a lot of jobs for me that people needed. The Lord, he'd open their minds up. I didn't, someone else did the praying. There's four or five families that I fasted and prayed for for a couple of weeks. And their eyes would open. The spirit of this world, the demonic spirit that now rules the sons of disobedience, they'd fall off of them, thank God, because you talk about Jesus in the beginning. Their eyes would glaze over, and they're just like they're in la-la land. What? Oh, I don't care about that stuff. Well, what's another? You keep them there about another two or three days, and all of a sudden, boom! I <laughs> open up fast and pray for them. Sometimes he'd get ready early. Thessalonians, a false teacher's coming in. What you have to do about it? All right. Turn to chapter one. I'll be reading out of the Amplified, no classic edition. I love to study with it. I don't have to look up a whole lot of words. It, Emphasize, expounds more in, into words. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silas, which is Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church and the assembly of the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Grace, unmerited favor be to you, and heart peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Paul spoke for them. He greeted them the same way he greets everybody. I'm writing back to you the grace, and God's grace be upon you. Open your eyes open up and you see things. We ought and indeed are obligated as those in debt to give thanks always to God for you. Brethren, as it's fitting, because your faith is growing exceedingly, and the love of every one of you each towards the others in increasing in amount love towards each other's brotherly love towards each other's he didn't say you like each other he said you love each other and we see it about him more and more and this is the cause of our mentioning you with pride among the churches the assemblies O oh god for our steadfastness your unflinching endurance and patience and your firm faith in the midst of all its persecution, prosecution, persecution, excuse me, and crushing distresses and afflictions under which you are holding up. This is a positive proof of the just and right judgment of God to the end that you may be deemed deserving of his kingdom in plain token of your fair verdict, which designs that you should be made and counted worthy of the kingdom of God, you should be made and counted worthy of the kingdom of God for the sake of which you're also suffering. All right. I'm going to eject things here and there. The first word in the gospel of Jesus Christ is repent. I'm not going to go into great deep depths about Greek words and what they mean, but I have, but because I needed to, I wasn't smart enough to know myself. It had to mean something else, okay? You had to change, change your mind and start putting all your effort into it with your spirit and your soul and your willpower and your thinkings and your doings and walk it out. I want you to understand if you start doing that, you suffer. And if you're not suffering, you're not doing. And I don't mean, you know, I'm going to go out and suffer intentionally and get somebody to punch me in the mouth. No. No, you've changed kingdoms. There'll be demons after you, people after you, things after you. In the old days, you all lost your job. You came to Christ, you didn't have a job. It was gone. They were a bunch of demon worshippers back then. They still are. They don't know it. Well, to be made account worthy, okay? He told you what to do. He will empower you to do it. Now you have to start being holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. What does that mean? 
Is there anything you could do to kind of get by with your stuff, what you want to sin with? If people sin with ungodly and crazy stuff, but you look good on the outside, but, but kind of crazy at night, some are drunks, smoke too much dope, take too many pills, have too much sex with strange people, and uh, not loyal to anything, you come to Christ. He made you worthy through Christ. Now you got to start walking out. Paul said you're doing it. Good. And you're suffering for it. Verse 6 says, It is a fair decision since it is a righteous thing that God to repay and distress, with distress, with distress, to repay and with distress and affliction those who distress and afflict you. Uh... There you go. And to recompense, payback. Recompense, you need to look it up. It means a lot. Recompense you who are so distressed and afflicted by granting you relief and rest along with us, your fellow sufferers, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in a flame of fire. It's all going to stop. Look to the person next to you, and may not be one there, and say, this deal's going to end, and I'm going to live in glory. There'll be no more pain, no more hurt, no more anguish, no more dread, no more waiting for the foot to, that, that foot to come down on you. It's going to be gone in flames of fire. Oh, that's the end. That's, that's where everybody is. All the body of Christ is going to be there, not just one. That also happens in your lifetime. You'll have times of R&R, rest and relaxation. It'll come by the Spirit of God to pour out rest and relaxation on you. And that oppression will leave you. You know, most of you are oppressed, and you don't know you're oppressed because you've been oppressed all your life. You come out of underneath that oppression, and you go, gosh, this is wonderful. Am I going to die shortly? No. It's the Lord refreshing you so you can go on at times. It's just it's going to be Him or nothing. People come give you nice words all the time, but it won't do much for you. Unless they're anointed, <coughs> unless the Lord comes, comes with his mighty angels of flame of fire. We're going to talk about all this stuff. To deal out retribution and chastisement and vengeance upon those who do not know or perceive or become acquainted with God, and upon those who ignore and refuse to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, during that time of Paul, we're talking about the Jews now. They ignore it and refuse to obey it. We're not talking about heathens that worship demons out there, what it are nothing, or themselves, or the mind or science. We're talking, these were Jews. He's talking about the Jews. They refuse to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They ignore it. Who ignore and refuse? They won't do it. They're not listening to Paul's message. Such people will pay the penalty and suffer the punishment of everlasting ruin. Now, this is for those of you who think Jesus is going to save everybody. Some way, one way or another. You just keep it in your mind. You won't go all the way. It's like grenades and pregnant. You either are or you're not. One or the other. Such people will pay the penalty and suffer the punishment of everlasting ruin, destruction, and perdition, and eternal exclusion and banishment from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. That's why I told people all the time, quit saying for you. You're asking him to come back. He said to pray, come back, Lord Jesus, come back. Come back quickly. Well, yeah, okay, but once you've been enlightened about things, you understand that when he comes back quickly, this shooting match is over with. There's a bunch of people going to heaven, and a bunch of people going to hell. And that's the way it's going to be. And all those wonderful grandmas and grandpas and uncles and aunties and people that you love so dearly, they're not inherently evil. They, they're good. They're good to you, and they've been good to you. They're, they're, they warm your heart through all your life. If they don't know Jesus, they're going to hell. Now, he grades on a curb um, with many people, on, but, but Jesus, he just goes straight in Jesus. And he said there'll be many stripes. There'll be the good boys, the bad, bad boys that will go in the kingdom. But when he talked about perdition, and he talked about everlasting ruin for those who do not follow the gospel, he wasn't kidding. And he doesn't grade like you do. He doesn't think like you do. He's not man. He's God. And that, some things I don't understand, don't argue with him about. 
There's things that he, he does that I don't do. There's things he likes that I don't like. There's things that he wants me to do and doesn't want me to do. There's people he's had me go to and warn them about certain things. You know, quit doing this, quit doing that, or this is going to happen to you because the devil's going to tear you up. And I didn't want to. I said, well, they deserve it. They're just bad people. Go tell them. Okay, all right. And he does this when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day. He will be made more glorious in his consecrated people. The pillars of the temple, if you got up right up to the top, there's a porch that leads out over those pillars, and it looks like the pillars are holding it up. You know. Those pillars are strong. Get up top there. There's no, the pillars don't touch it. They're not holding it up. They went out and shined that up every day. Brass and bronze, pretty. Sun gleamed off of it. It's in Jerusalem. But the pillars didn't hold that up. He made them pretty. He shined them up. By his consecrated people. And he will be marveled at and admired in his glory reflected in all who have believed who have adhered to and trusted in and relied on him he's not so much coming to get the evil out of the world as he came to get the evil out of you turn you into holiness and righteousness you won't look like the devil's child his power coming into you the spirit of his holiness in you because our witnessing among you was confidently and accepted and believed and confirmed in your lives what Paul told them. Because you're working it out and they're whipping on you, beating on you and hurting you and you're still doing it. Because of Jesus, not us, but you believed us. I think one of the greatest things is for somebody to believe you. Not just to love you, not to love you, but to believe you. That they believe you. Without a bunch of fear. The communist and dictators and so forth. Well, they're believed because they'll kill you. Adolf Hitler, you shoot one of those Nazis in a town and so forth, they'd haul out a hundred of you and shoot you. A hundred to one. Some said she just blew up. Just go blow him up. You fear him because you, you will do what he says or he'll kill you. Fear of death all her lifetime. Well, well, this in view, we constantly pray for you, Paul said, verse 11, that our God may deem and count you worthy of your calling. And his every gracious purpose of goodness, he wants goodness for you. And with the power may complete in you your every particular work of faith that you do. Faith which is that lean of the whole human personality on God. Every bit of you. And you don't have a plan B. You, you have God's plan. There's no plan B. On God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, in his wisdom, in his goodness... Verse 12, thus may the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified and become more glorious through and in you. And may you also be glorified in him according to the grace, the favor, and blessing of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Now, I want to go back and explain some of this and what was going on at the time. But if you'll read that and you saw that, and I just read it to you, he wants you to work with him and be glorious. All things work for the good of them that love God. What he's aiming for is that you be like his son. And I'll tell you right now, it's going to be a rough way to go for some of us. I'm included. I'm not smart. I'm not real smart. I'll just stop doing this, stop doing that. Sometimes justification wouldn't even think it's a sin. That's not a sin. Well, it is a sin because I'm thinking wrong. In Romans, Paul tells you there's there's the sinners that are fleshly sinners. They're drunks and wild fornicators and partiers. And there's obvious that they're sinners. Then there are those that are intellectuals and religious sinners also. They sin away with their intellectualism. You could you could go ahead and split the atom and no one no no needs to know such deep secrets of the universe deep inside, but you don't know who made them. You're a sinner too. Looking down your nose at people. Judged them hard. I've seen so many people judge. I judge Christians myself, often. And I'll tell God, I don't like your people. They're kind of dumb and hard. They can't explain anything to me. I, I don't know how many people I had growing up when I was a kid. You born again? What does that mean? I'm a Catholic. Of course I'm born again, whatever that means. They could not explain to you what that meant, or they didn't want to. I have no idea. 
but they did strange things and they said strange things and it's like common sense went out the door and praise the Lord for everything it was great but I couldn't talk to them I didn't know what they, they just, I don't know gibberish coming out of them half the time and they were good old boys good old girls but I didn't didn't understand I didn't understand at all a little different than anybody else I thought because they didn't look any different than anybody else they just spoke a different language to me but then I met some Christians that shined well it's Jesus shining out of them and you know they came from a hard road some of them were ex-drunks, ex-prostitutes, ex-murderers. But they, the Jesus got hold of them. They, he was in them. And he was trying, their hardest they tried to get Jesus in people. Trying to explain it to them. Until they, they sit down and start reading and started getting and listening to the Holy Spirit. And they could tell you what it was to be born again. What the doctrines were. What you had to learn. Where, where you had to overcome. They, they could tell you when to keep your mouth shut and when to talk. What to do. This one will be kind of short. We're going to go over this again. I kind of want to detail. I want to go into 2 Corinthians. Paul explains certain things, especially about this, this raptures and carrying away and taking away. And There's another place where it says gathering together. Is That, that word's only used two places when you gather together. In Hebrews, it talks about gathering together, and that was the congregation at the time, the church at the time. This, this gathering together in the clouds with the Lord, is, he's talking about the whole body of Christ, not one person left out. They're all going to join him in the clouds, forever be with him. Now, are they going to ride off on their ponies to heaven? Are they coming back here at the time? Is it a secret? There's no secret coming of the Lord. If you meet him in the air, then there's going to be millions of you gone. And they show movies of jets flying into people. And they say, that Lord doesn't do that sort of stuff. He's not going to do that. He's trying to save people, not kill them all. Now, there have been nations that have disappeared because of sin. You go so far into darkness that the Lord will kill your nation. It's gone. I worry about America all the time. You know how many babies we kill every year? And don't give me your abortion stuff. We have a right with our bodies and so forth. Blah, 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 blah. It's murder. And I'm seeing the election go right now of Biden and his crew of darkness. They want to legalize murder. I, a woman has a right to be a murderer. We have laws against murderers. A little fella in the womb needs to be protected by their mother and their father as much as they possibly can. That's your job. It's not your job to kill him and murder him and dig him out of you. That's not your job. That's not what you're supposed to do just common sense anyway the next one we'll go over this in greater detail because I think there's some things we can glean out of this for us right now which would be pretty good if you don't know Jesus make him your Lord today dear Lord Jesus come into my heart come in to stay I'll do the best I can with everything I know right now I'm just going to worship you and praise you and thank you and thank you for baptizing me in the Holy Spirit I ask you to baptize me in the Holy Spirit I'll read up on that. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and I'll receive it. I'll get baptized in water as soon as possible. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, if you pray that prayer, don't start reading your Bible in Revelation. Find a good church to go to, and one that speaks in tongues, and doesn't preach the wrath of God all the time, and is in the New Testament most of the time. The fellowship is good. People are kind, wonderful, good to you. They encourage you. They don't beat you up. This is Mike. I'll see you next time. Jesus is Lord.